Tonight we have the honor of having Dr. Philip Johnson here speaking to us. He is a graduate of both uh, Harvard University and the University of Chicago School of Law. He served as a law clerk of Chief Justice Earl Warren. Dr. Johnson taught law at the University of California, Berkeley for over 30 years and has written five books. He is best, his best-selling work was Darwin on Trial, which launched the intelligent design movement, which has transformed the public debate over uh, scientific difficulties with Darwinism. Our speaker has lectured and debated at uh, universities all across the country, and I believe we will be challenged and provoked at what he has to say here tonight. So will you please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Philip Johnson. Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, folks. It was uh, good of you to uh, battle your way uh, through the snows and uh, ice and everything to come. Uh, you know, every so often, I have to get out of California where the weather is so boring always good. Come to somewhere where it's more interesting. I'll start tonight with the year 1959, when I was a college student. Uh, that was the centennial, that is the hundredth anniversary, of the publication of Charles Darwin's masterpiece, uh, The Origin of Species, which launched the modern uh, evolutionary uh, movement. Uh, the uh, uh, evolutionary biologists of the world gathered at the University of Chicago in 1959 uh, over Thanksgiving Day weekend uh, to express their thanksgiving for the great worldwide triumph of Darwinism, but they, no, they were not thanking God. <laughs> uh, the uh, 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 the keynote speaker on that occasion was a man named uh, Julian Huxley, who is the grandson of uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog, as so-called at the first, who took the leading role in promoting and doing the political uh, uh, work to uh, put uh, Darwin's theory over in uh, uh, England and to make it the ruling uh, creed. Uh, 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 Julian Huxley, in his keynote address, uh, remarked that it had now been firmly established that evolution, as described by uh, Charles Darwin, uh, was the story of how uh, human beings and all living things had been created. They said, and this story uh, left no room for what he called a divinized father figure, that is, an imaginary god based on a projection of our own human fathers, uh, 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 that that would have to be dropped uh, as an idea. And so now it must be recognized that every aspect of reality was evolving in an instance of uh, evolution, including human thinking and in human religion. So this was a triumphal celebration. Now, the Darwinists felt in such a triumphal mood because of uh, some things which had happened in the 1950s that greatly increased their uh, confidence. Uh, they acknowledged that at the time uh, Darwin first promulgated his theory in 1859, uh, 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 he did not have any evidence of the key mechanism of his evolutionary theory, that is natural selection, uh, doing anything in the wild. You see, everything, uh, including human beings, was supposed to have evolved from simple beginnings by the steady progress of natural selection, the survival of the fittest. Uh, but Darwin had no examples of this natural selection in the wild. Uh, lacking that evidence, he had to rely primarily on uh, an analogy to uh, domestic animal breeding, which scientists call artificial selection. You know, dog breeding, uh, 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 pigeon breeding, uh, 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 breeding sheep to get the wooliest uh, coats, and so on. Uh, artificial uh, selection. And, and, and Darwin argued that what man could do, accomplish in a few thousand years, to have all these breeds of dogs, you know, from Great Danes to Chihuahuas and everything in between, 
and, and nature, if man could do that in a few thousand years, nature could certainly do much greater feats of creation uh, with natural selection operating over uh, immensely longer uh, periods of time. There was, however, this gap in the theory that the scientists would like to have seen some direct evidence of natural selection in the wild, and they thought they had it. In 1959, uh, a man named uh, Bernard Kettlewell uh, published a, an article uh, titled uh, Darwin's Missing Evidence. This was what the evolutionary scientists were looking for, the missing evidence of natural selection in the wild. Uh, this was, uh, uh, Kettlewell was a moth collector, uh, a retired medical doctor, not really an experimental scientist at all, but an, something of an expert on moths. Uh, and he uh, did uh, some experiments to test a theory uh, that the Darwinists had about uh, moth populations in England. Uh, what had happened was simply this. Uh, uh, there's a species of moth in the Midlands of Eng England, uh, 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 a peppered moth, which has both light and dark varieties. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, most of the moths in the population were of the light-colored variety. That's a sort of a tan. Uh, but a minority were, were dark, black. Uh, uh, then, uh, in the Industrial Revolution, the factories spewed out this terrible pollution. Uh, and the lichen that grew on the tree trunks where the moths rested, according to the theory, uh, was killed. The tree trunks became covered with soot. Now, before the soot came, the light-colored moths were uh, camouflaged against the light-colored tree trunks, tree, tree trunks. And the moths uh, who eat the birds, excuse me, the birds who eat the moths, the birds who eat the moths uh, could not see the light-colored moths. So the light-colored moths thrived, and the birds ate the dark-colored moths. There weren't very many dark moths. Uh, then, uh, the, when the trees became darkened, the dark-colored moths uh, did not stand out against the tree trunks. And they had the better uh, camouflage. The birds ate the light-colored moths, and the percentage of light-colored moths in the population declined. So they were mostly dark-colored. Uh, then, in the 20th century, air pollution laws were passed. Uh, the tree trunks became light-colored again. The lichen grew back. Um, and once again, the light-colored moths had the advantage of better camouflage. The birds did not see them, uh, and so the moth population became predominantly light-colored again. See, from predominantly light to predominantly dark to predominantly light. That's where the population uh, shifted. Uh, no moth changed color. There were both light and dark-colored moths in the population throughout. It was just a question of the relative uh, frequency of the one variety as opposed to the uh, other. Uh, Kettlewell um, uh, did uh, careful uh, experiments uh, that uh, purported to prove uh, that this, this had really occurred, that it was the uh, birds uh, uh, eating the moths and uh, uh, in, in a different uh, moths in different uh, years that caused uh, this uh, shift. And this was the missing evidence that the scientists uh, needed to proclaim Darwin's theory triumphant. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, that was perhaps the most important new evidence, but it wasn't all that happened in the 1950s. The, if um, the uh, uh, theory of evolution could explain uh, how one kind of living thing can change into another, even explain how a uh, uh, well, perhaps a single-celled creature like a bacterium could become a moth, and a moth then a human being. Uh, there would still be a problem at the beginning. Where did life come from in the first place? How did you get life started so that this process of biological evolution and change uh, could go on? They didn't have an answer for that. But then in 1952, say I'm still with events in the 1950s, and at the University of Chicago again, very exciting place, um, a, a graduate student named uh, Stanley Miller in a chemistry uh, laboratory did an experiment uh, 
in, in which he sent uh, electrical charges through a mixture of gases in this chemical uh, uh, apparatus. And the mixture of gases was thought to resemble the kinds of gases that would have been present on the early Earth before life had appeared. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, 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 Miller checked on the results of his uh, experiment, he found that there were a number of chemicals that had gathered in a sort of a, a puddle at the bottom of his apparatus, and th those included some amino acids. And if you've had any chemistry, or particularly biochemistry, you would know that uh, amino acids are used in the building of proteins. And proteins, then, are the building blocks of life, the essential components of any living uh, uh, system. Uh, and so this excited the uh, uh, Darwinists uh, very much. And that experiment has been shown count in countless times on television programs, in museum exhibits, and in classrooms as sort of essentially showing how uh, life uh, can be created from non-living chemicals uh, without any intelligent assistance or anything but just the electricity going through the gases. Uh, so you get life started uh, that way. Now, um, uh, it, uh, uh, it is apparent from both of these uh, examples that the Darwinists were very easily convinced of the correctness of their theory. And they didn't have a lot of, I'd say, sales resistance. Uh, but they were easily convinced. Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the moth observations, assuming that everything is as it was described, uh, you know, it's all correct on its face, uh, only showed how you would get a shifting population of sometimes more dark moths, sometimes more light moths, in a moth population that is fundamentally stable. You see, it's, uh, if you look at the time period as a whole, it's not changing. It's just fluctua fluctuating within this uh, time period. You have moths at the beginning, you have moths at the end, and basically the same moth population. Uh, what needs to be proved if the Darwinian theory is to be supported, is how you get moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place. Uh, but, um, see, the Darwinists were easily convinced because they knew that their theory basically had to be true regardless of the evidence. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, by that time, uh, uh, the scientific community had defined a science as the project of explaining everything in the universe on the basis of natural causes and natural causes only. I'd say that, that means unintelligent material causes. So, uh, to, to put it in the negative, God had to be ruled out of scientific consideration altogether. Uh, uh, now, if uh, God is ruled out of consideration, then you can't say God did any creating. So then nature has to do the creating with its own resources. That being the case, then something more or less like Darwin's theory has to be true as a matter of logic. You don't need evidence to come to that conclusion. And in fact, uh, many Darwinists have made precisely that argument. Uh, Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous Darwinist today, says that uh, if life exists on distant planets where we can never go and make observations, we know it must have evolved by the Darwinian method, random variations in natural selection. And how do we know that? Well, says Dawkins, what would be your alternative? You might say, God created that life. Dawkins replies, oh, that's religion. God belongs to religion, not science, where we talk about what really happened. So uh, that's how he can conclude that without any observations whatsoever, we know that life evolved by Darwin's method of natural selection on those distant planets. There's nothing else that could have happened. Uh, that attitude helps to explain, I think, why the biologists were so easily convinced by, for example, the peppered moth uh, observations uh, that uh, uh, that this uh, same process that made the peppered moths shift in color, the population shift, uh, uh, would account for how you get moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place. 
Uh, likewise, uh, the Stanley Miller experiment, you know, with the electrical charges uh, producing uh, the uh, uh, amino acids, um, uh, it left something out, you know, which is that it takes more than amino acids to make uh, something come alive. You can buy amino acids from a chemical supply house, and you can mix them together and a dish uh, for quite as long as you like, and I guarantee you that no living organism is going to emerge. You know, so uh, this production of the, the chemical components was certainly only a first step towards the production of life. The Darwinists conceded this. They understood that. But they said that it w was enough to show the first step because they knew on independent grounds that it must be possible to produce life by a purely natural process from non-living chemicals. How did they know that? Nothing else could have happened, could it? Hey, what would be your alternative? God created? Well, we know the answer to that by now, don't we? Okay. So it's, only, it's, it's not a question of whether life evolved from non-life by some chemical process. It's just a question of precisely what it was. And see, Stanley Miller had identified how you could make one step, and that was enough uh, to, to say you could go all the rest of the way, for sure. So, so uh, then uh, another uh, experiment, uh, which had much more important consequences for science as a whole, uh, occurred in 1953. Okay, we've got the peppered moths. We've got the... Uh, the Stanley Miller experiment, and now we have the famous Watson Crick, uh, a discovery of the uh, structure of the molecule DNA, the, the molecule of heredity. Now this uh, that discovery led to the uh, takeoff in modern molecular biology through the Human Genome Project and through all the uh, uh, visionary uh, uh, claims for uh, you know, the ability to clone uh, human beings and all of that that we're hearing about. And nowadays, a lot of these claims have not been uh, demonstrated yet, but they have people very excited. Uh, they also excited the evolutionary biologists because they said, now we know not just the effects of evolution, but we know we can see how it works uh, at the molecular level. The DNA contains the information which is needed to uh, construct proteins and fold them properly. And the DNA can mutate. It can accumulate random changes. And then those will change the proteins and uh, we'll get uh, something new appearing, and that's evolution. So that also increased their confidence very greatly. Uh, and, and, and so uh, as of 1959, uh, uh, you can see this sense that uh, evolution is all-conquering. And if everybody doesn't believe in it yet, they eventually will. There was this confidence. But there's no more opposition uh, uh, worth uh, speaking of. Another event happened in the 50s that influenced this progress. In 1957, when I was a college freshman, the Soviet Union put up the Sputnik, mm -hmm. the first manned uh, satellite. And that sent the American scientific establishment and defense department into a panic. See, it seemed that the communists, who we had you know, held in low regard, were going to uh, be the conquerors of space. This would be an unbearable blow to the prestige of American science and uh, a danger to the defense of the country as well when they put spaceships up there. Uh, so this led the American government to embark on a crash program in science education. We had to teach everybody to think like a scientist. In part, uh, this uh, program of education that went, then went into full uh, speed uh, was aimed at producing professional scientists who would discover new things, uh, but that wasn't the only uh, goal. It was also meant to educate, or you might say indoctrinate, the entire uh, uh, population in scientific ways of thinking so that they would respect science and support it with their votes and their money. And, as on, since this was deemed to be necessary. And a big part of that program was teaching the young people of the country and all of the schools to believe in evolution. They, to, to think like a scientist required uh, accepting the scientific way of thinking about the origin of life and uh, the, the creation of human beings. And that's when the uh, new textbooks uh, came in that were, were sparked by a federal government program that uh, uh, put evolution front and center and uh, uh, with an effort to 
you know, make everybody a believer. Uh, now, um, that's how things were as of the 1960s. But then there was a change, or at least the beginnings of a change, just the beginnings of a change. Um, the uh, things that were said at that 1959 the convention and the attempt to indoctrinate the whole public and the, the general sense that uh, science was being used to push God out of reality and out of existence led to a backlash. The first backlash was the formation in the 1960s of the creation science movement uh, by uh, uh, Henry Morris, a professor of uh, hydraulic engineering at the Virginia Technical University, and uh, Duane Gish, who had a degree in uh, biochemistry from my own university at Berkeley. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the creation science movement aimed to protect the Bible, see, to defend uh, the biblical account of creation against this, uh, uh, these claims of uh, scientific uh, evolution. Uh, it had quite an impact. Uh, but the impact was, to some degree, limited, to quite a degree limited, uh, by the nature of the, the creation science movement that they uh, formed. Uh, uh, the, the, the movement was limited to uh, uh, people who affirmed that they believed the entire Bible taken literally. See, and, and so hence the creation science movement was taking on a lot more than evolution. They were making the claim that the earth was created about 6,000 years ago in six 24-hour days. Uh, and a lot of people uh, who are skeptical of the vast claims that were being made for evolution were not willing to sign on to uh, the, the complete uh, Genesis uh, read literally uh, 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 creation uh, uh, account. That they, uh, uh, so they, they, they wouldn't uh, go along with this uh, uh, movement. It was also of enormous importance to uh, Henry Morris and his creation science movement uh, to prove that uh, there had been a worldwide flood you know, in, the, in the time of Noah. And that was yet another issue. Uh, uh, so this necessarily meant that the creation scientists were to a large part on the defensive. They had to defend a whole lot, a whole lot that modern science and modern thinking uh, generally uh, rejected. So th this went on, and, and it, it isn't that the creation scientists didn't accomplish anything. There are, after all, millions of fundamentalist Christians in the United States you know, who were quite favorable to this uh, uh, movement. And so, so uh, the, the steamroller of Darwinian uh, imperialism was to some degree checked, uh, even though this movement was necessarily limited by the kind of agenda that they had taken on. So, so that, that kind of ended in a, a deadlock. The uh, Darwinists ruled the educational system the media, the television stations, uh, uh, the universities, and the public purse. But there was still this large uh, community of dissenters out there. Uh, then, in the 1990s, something new emerged that got the Darwinists, the evolutionary scientists, uh, the scientific community at large very worried. And this was the emergence of the intelligent design movement. Uh, the opening uh, uh, of that uh, was the publication of my own book, uh, Darwin on Trial, which just happens to be, I, I think, for sale over there at the book table, <laughs> by coincidence. <laughs> now, uh, my approach to this issue was very different from that of creation science. Okay? I began by saying uh, the thing to do here is not to be defending the Bible or defending anything else. Say, I don't want to set up a defensive line uh, to defend uh, Noah's flood or, or whatever. Uh, I'm not going to deal with that issue. Um, I want to take the ball and go on offense and simply to look at the logic of the Darwinian system of belief and to see if it is logical or illogical. Uh, and that uh, is what I uh, want to do. Uh, uh, now, uh, what I said was that uh, the, um, the central Darwinian claim is not that the Earth is millions of years old or that things came about by a gradual process rather than a sudden one. They, they make that claim, but that's not what the theory is all about. The central Darwinian claim is that all of the creating of life, all of the biological creation that was necessary, 
could occur and did occur by a completely natural process, which means an unintelligent process, okay, of uh, 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 a process that incorporated two elements, random variations in the DNA, in the, in the genes, okay, what we call mutations today, random changes, and then uh, the fact that the changes, that the creatures that were randomly changed might be, be better or worse at surviving and reproducing. If the change happened to make a particular critter better at surviving and reproducing than the other critters in the population, uh, then that critter would leave the most descendants, they, they, much more, many more descendants offspring than others, and would pass on its genes to the next generation. Whereas if another critter uh, was defective and never lived to reproduce, uh, it would not leave any uh, genes to the next generation. So the Darwinian claim is that all it takes is these elements, random change, and then the beneficial changes accumulated and passed on through natural selection, and you can get all of the biological creating done. Uh, 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 assuming that you can start the process with this chemical evolution that produces life in the first place. Now that is the claim. So I, I said, and as I founded the intelligent design movement, let's just look at the claim. What is the evidence for it? Is it true? Is it supported by evidence? And I brought up to uh, elucidate that uh, problem, we have two definitions of science in our culture. People don't know this, or they think the two definitions amount to the same thing, but they don't. They're quite contradictory. According to one definition, science is the impartial investigation of evidence without prejudice. You look at the evidence and you follow it where the evidence points, uh, uh, without uh, prejudice. That's the advertised definition of science. But there's another definition which trumps the first one, and we've already seen that. I've already indicated that in operation to you. Um, the, the second definition is that science is the human project of explaining everything in the world on the basis of natural causes and natural causes only. If, if you have to explain all living things on the basis of natural causes and natural causes only, then something more or less like Darwinian evolution has to be true, regardless of the evidence. In other words, you start out with a prejudice. Uh, you know that there has to be a process that will produce living, simple living things from non-living chemicals. You just have to you know, see if you can figure out exactly what it is. But it has to exist anyway. And that's why, if you hold that belief, you're so satisfied by fragmentary evidence, like the Stanley Miller experiment. You know it's got to be true anyway. So then you think you have evidence to support your conclusion, but you only have the evidence because you, you had the belief. See? And so you were easily satisfied. So I asked the question in my first book, Darwin on Trial, and other books, what if you don't make that assumption? See, what if you... I use the first definition of science, the impartial investigation of evidence. So uh, on, on, that, on that definition, I might say, I am willing to consider the possibility that there is a process which can take a simple living thing, like a bacterium, and gradually turn it into something much more complicated, like a butterfly or a human being. I'm willing to consider that, but prove it to me. They show me that it's true. Well, if I take that view, then if I look at the peppered moth evidence, I'm clearly not going to be convinced that such a process has been demonstrated. Am I? That's, I'm going to say that evidence is completely inadequate. And, and, and likewise, if I see that you might be able to produce some amino acids by sending electrical charges through a mixture of gases, uh, that isn't going to uh, 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 show me that you can produce the highly complicated uh, a thing called a living organi organism, that you can produce the, the vast amount of information that is necessary to direct the processes of life. I want that to be demonstrated. Well, it's the two definitions. I, I, I question which one uh, rules. Um, if you have to prove uh, your case, uh, you don't seem to be proving it. And that makes me think that Darwinian evolution is more a matter of philosophy than of scientific experimentation. 
and impartial investigation of uh, evidence. So uh, that's what I, how I began the intelligent design movement. You see, and then we went back through each of the pieces of evidence that I'm, I've been talking about tonight. Uh, I, 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 I'll mention the, the peppered moth uh, uh, first because it's had so much importance. Darwinists have emphasized it in every textbook and every museum exhibit. You hear about it all the time. It's practically synonymous with evolution. But it turns out you know, that the, the, the experiment is not only inadequate to prove how you get moths in the first place, but it, it, it didn't happen that way anyway. It didn't happen the way it's been described. In the last five years, a lot of information has come out about uh, the moth experiment, and it turns out that it's just not so. Uh, the, the moths in question are night flyers. They're nocturnal. Uh, they, 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 in the day, they fly up high in the branches where they're out of sight. What they do not do is rest on tree trunks. It, it's extremely rare ever to see a moth on a tree trunk. There are, there are a couple of reported cases, but hardly any. See, that's not where they rest uh, as, a, as a normal. So it doesn't matter what color the uh, tree trunks uh, uh, are. The experiment isn't even valid on its own terms. Uh, the same thing is true of the Stanley Miller experiment. Not only is it inadequate to show how you get life started, uh, but nowadays the, the mainstream uh, scientific doctrine of the composition of the gases on the early Earth uh, has changed enormously from Stanley Miller's time. And so they no, no longer believe that he had the gases right. And if you send the electrical charges through a proper combination of gases that reflects contemporary scientific belief, you don't get any amino acids. Uh, now, um, the, 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 I, I make no similar criticism of the Watson-Crick demonstration of the structure of DNA. But the important thing to understand about DNA, once you begin to think you know, critically about it, is that the DNA is important not because of the chemicals that make it up, but because of the arrangement of what are called the nucleotides on the DNA molecule. The nucleotides are often called uh, uh, chemical letters. They are, uh, they are uh, arranged um, uh, according to a specific pattern, and that, 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 much like the letters on a page of paper. So you can think of an instruction book in ink letters. Well, these are chemical letters. The, the information that they convey that is transmitted to the proteins and directs the protein synthesis, the information that they convey, all has to do with the arrangement of the letters. The letters are not arranged according to the chemical laws that govern the composition of DNA. If they were arranged, they wouldn't convey any information. Uh, similarly, if the letters on a page of paper were arranged according to the chemical laws that govern the combining of ink and paper, the book would not convey any, any instructions, any information. So the, the whole uh, significance of DNA of the, is the information contained in the arrangement of the nucleotides, the chemical uh, letters. And where does that come from? It's a mystery. How does that information get produced uh, in the uh, first place? So uh, uh, as we go back, we see all of the uh, items of evidence have uh, uh, turned out to uh, uh, be uh, extremely uh, 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 doubtful. Uh, and now, uh, this has been an extremely uh, disturbing phenomenon to the evolutionary science uh, community. They, they were com convinced in the 1960s following that 1959 triumphal celebration, that with their educational indoctrination programs, with the television stations promoting uh, 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 evolution, the government uh, supplying the textbooks and all, that they would uh, 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 gradually win the public over to believe uh, in the theory. And yet, uh, after uh, uh, more than 30 years of this, and uh, uh, 40 years, um, the uh, 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 the state of public opinion hasn't changed all that much. Uh, public opinion polls that are accepted uh, by everyone, the promoters of evolution and the opponents of evolution, show that a majority of the American public is skeptical of the theory to one degree or another. A large minority, about 40% of the, the uh, population, accepts creation science see, with its young earth of 6,000 years. Uh, and another uh, 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 large uh, minority, something like 45 percent, 
uh, thinks that, well, there was a process of evolution, but that it must have been God-guided. Must have been guided by God. Now that is equally disturbing uh, to the, uh, the people I call the mandarins, the, the, the bosses of evolutionary science, because you see, the whole purpose of evolution of the evolutionary theory, the whole purpose of Darwin's theory, is to show how you can get life started and you can get all the creating done without God. Uh, and, 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 and thus the, the, the science, as they define it, does not allow for any participation by anything supernatural, by God, to put it simply, uh, at any stage of the proceedings. That's against the most basic rule of evolutionary science. Uh, uh, to the um, Darwinist, the evolutionary scientist, God-guided evolution isn't evolution at all. It's slow creationism. Uh, 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 the whole point is to uh, 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 develop a system that has no need for that uh, divine uh, guidance. Uh, uh, and so we now have a, this, this uh, conflict going on, and uh, to the horror of the Darwinists, uh, not only has the public dissent uh, persisted, but it has uh, 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 moved into the academic world itself. So that we have professors from leading universities, uh, uh, PhD intellectuals, uh, uh, holding uh, 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 conferences at universities and everywhere I'm speaking, and a large uh, amount of student skepticism as well as fa faculty skepticism, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the situation is uh, coming uh, unglued. Uh, in this uh, situation, the intelligent design movement and, and my own writings have said that what the, what the uh, science establishment and the education establishment has to do is to come clean and be honest and teach the controversy in the schools, in the colleges, in the graduate schools, you know, and in the culture at large, to teach the controversy. That is, the honest thing to do is, sure, go ahead and teach what the Darwinian scientists believe happened. That's something that students should learn, should know. We're not against uh, teaching the official theory. Go ahead and teach it, but also teach why it's controversial. Teach why so many people uh, uh, are skeptical of it to some degree or another. Uh, well, um, uh, the, uh, the Darwinists tend to say in response to that, well, there isn't really any controversy to teach. And the reason that there isn't any controversy to teach is that there's no controversy in the you know, refereed, peer-reviewed scientific literature. There you don't find anything but uh, uh, articles saying that, of course, we know that evolution has happened and it involves only natural forces, a random variation in natural selection. Uh, the only question is, certain minor issues about the details. Well, of course that's true in the peer-reviewed literature because if you submit an article uh, that, that questions the theory in any fundamental way, uh, the, 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 the peer reviewers and the editors don't allow it to be published because they will say it isn't science. Why isn't it science? Well, remember, science is defined as the project of explaining everything in naturalistic terms. And the only naturalistic explanation we have is Darwinism. And so if you attack Darwinism, you're a creationist. And that means you're not in science at all and you're not eligible to be, uh, be heard. So that is uh, how the uh, controversy uh, stands uh, 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 now. And uh, what has happened is that um, it has come uh, very much alive in our uh, 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 decades, at, at, at the start of the new century. Uh, and. Uh, uh, there has been a much broader uh, a base of criticism of Darwinism because we've gotten away in the intelligent design movement from tying the critique of Darwinian evolution to all those uh, uh, other issues. Now, at the age of the earth and Noah, Noah's flood and all and so on, I don't take any position about that. That's a different subject. You know, as I say, I'm uh, sticking to the, the most important thing, which is the claim of this creation mechanism that can... Uh, 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 do all the creating without any, you know, intelligent input. And we define this as the intelligent design movement. That is, our positive contention is that if you look at the evidence impartially and without uh, favor, without, without, uh, without a prejudice, you will come to two conclusions. One is that it is very much unsubstantiated, you know, that natural selection 
Darwin's mechanism has any creative power whatsoever. It's never done anything more than the kind of thing that's illustrated by the moth example. There are other examples one can give, but they're all basically the same. They're just back and forth shifts in a population. There's no real creating going on, nothing new. Uh, uh, so the creation mechanism flunks the test of scientific testing. Um, and then, in fact, the evidence uh, of life uh, uh, containing, a, 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 the living organisms contain a very high information content. Richard Dawkins, the most famous Darwinist, uh, uh, happily concedes this. He says that even a, a, a bacterial cell, the simplest organism, contains more information to order all of its activities than all the volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica combined. And that is evidence of intelligence you know, in the production of that information. Uh, so the evidence tends to point you in the direction of intelligent causes necessarily operating in biology. Now, whether those intelligent causes amount to you know, God, the God of the Bible or whatever, is a separate question. You have to go outside of biology to answer that. Uh, and, 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 and that, that but, but, but what we can say from the biology and from the scientific evidence is simply that the evidence points to the need to consider intelligent uh, causes. And so uh, we are confident, and I'm absolutely confident, that if we can get this controversy opened up, if we can get the controversy taught, you see, instead of the indoctrination, that don't think about this, just believe what it says in the book kind of approach to teaching. If we can get open debate in the scientific world, in, in, in short, if we can bring freedom of thought and freedom of expression to this you know, area which has been ruled by a sort of totalitarian uh, 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 lockstep uh, uh, thought control system, uh, 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 then uh, the Darwinian system will collapse and we will begin to approach a realistic understanding of what life really is and uh, what or who we should credit you know, uh, for uh, uh, bringing it uh, 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 about. And that is the story of Darwinism, obviously, in brief. Uh, if you want to know all about it, you can get that uh, from uh, the books, uh, mine, uh, uh, that happen to be here tonight, uh, others from the intelligent design movement, and uh, books that are coming out from independent sources now, which tell you the history uh, of the uh, movements that are uh, going on. Even our enemies. I, 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 you know, if, if you're in doubt, so by, by all means, read the books of our enemies, um, uh, but with a critical eye. I think you'll see that they're very angry and very upset and very worried. <laughs> and, and all this, uh, almost 50 years after their triumphal celebration, they're very upset and very worried, and that tells you something, uh, too. Well, uh, there we are. That's the uh, lecture part uh, of my presentation tonight. Uh, I just give the lecture in, in, in order to set up uh, the questions <laughs> that, uh, 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 and uh, now uh, our moderator is coming to uh, 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 preside over the taking of, uh, of uh, questions uh, and uh, I'd be glad to uh, attempt to answer anything that people would like to ask. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Johnson. For <laughs> and we now have the opportunity, as he stated, to ask some questions. And he's going to give us about 45 minutes of his time to uh, answer our questions tonight. There are two ways you can ask questions. Uh, you should have a white card that was given to you by uh, when you came in tonight, uh, you can fill this out and give, us, give it to one of the ushers, and they will take your question up to the front. Or you can also come up to one of the microphones up front here and ask a question. And uh, we ask that you please keep your comments to questions only. Uh, don't make any statements or speeches. We don't have the time for that. Or it's out of respect for our speaker tonight, just keep your comments to a question only. Thank you. And um, let's get the ball rolling here. Um, does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Please step up to the. Um, your, your, your first name, Paul? No, it's Philip Johnson. Uh, excuse me. Philip, um, punctuated equilibrium. Uh, could you explain that in the context mm -hmm. of evolution and also creationism? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good question. I'm asked to, uh, uh, to explain punctuated equilibrium. Um, in uh, around 1980, 
uh, I began to read a lot of publicity in the scientific uh, press uh, about a great controversy raging uh, uh, over a new theory of the fossil record uh, by uh, two scientists, one Professor Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University and another uh, his collaborator Niles Eldridge of the American Museum of Natural History, New York. And, and uh, what they were saying is that the fossil record presents a great problem for Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution has always predicted that there should be a slow and steady progressive change from one kind of thing to another recorded in the fossil record. In Darwin's time, uh, this was noted as a problem. And Darwin said, well, I'll tell you the answer to your problem. It's that the fossil record is very incomplete. They haven't found all the fossils yet. So you aren't finding the... Um, uh, fossils that my theory would expect that are transitional forms between one kind of thing and another because they haven't been found yet. They're out there. Keep looking. And Darwin said, you see, I, I never would have known how incomplete the fossil record really is uh, until I found that it so completely fails to give the evidence required to demonstrate my theory. He really did write that in The Origin of Species. You say he knew the record must be incomplete because it didn't show the transitionals. Well, in 1980, Gould and Eldridge said the transitionals are still absent. We still haven't found them. They said what we have to imagine is that evolution occurred uh, this way. See, that most of the time it doesn't occur. The usual pattern in the fossil record is stasis, which is the absence of change, the absence of evolution, stasis. Then every so often, a small group of organisms, you know, let's say it's a herd of old cattle or something, a small group of organisms detaches itself and goes off into the distance somewhere, into an isolated area, and hides. And there it accumulates mutations, and it evolves and changes into something different. And then it, it comes back and joins the main herd. It looks like something new has come in, I say, because you don't see the transition. The transition occurs offstage, as it were. That, in a simplified form, is what the theory of evolution by punctuated equilibria was. You see, stasis punctuated by periods of rapid change that are not fossilized. And that's why there's the absence of the fossil uh, uh, evidence. Gould went so far as to call this absence, the, the relative rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record, he said, is the trade secret of paleontology, the trade secret of fossil experts. Well, that by, is what lured me into the field. See, I had been taught all my life, as most people have, that the fossil record completely confirmed Darwinian evolution in every degree. Now to find out that it didn't, and there was this trade secret that had been concealed, it led my nose to twitch. Um, and and uh, uh, that was the first uh, a little enticement that brought me into the field. So that's a very short explanation. If you'd like to learn more about that, it's in chapter four of my first book, Darwin on Trial. Thank you. And here, I'll read one of our submitted questions. Uh, what about those who say there are animals on the Galapagos Islands still evolving? Does hmm. Uh, Mendel's pea plant support evolution. Oh, <laughs> uh, the Galapagos uh, I I Islands are famous in evolutionary uh, lore. Uh, 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 there are, uh, you know, supposedly uh, uh, 12 or 13 species of, of finches on different islands that are slightly different from each other because uh, they have different diets and different environmental conditions. Now, Darwin didn't make much of this when he was there in the years before he came out with his theory. They were co the, 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 the collected and classified later on uh, by another uh, scientist uh, after the uh, theory. But they're often used as a great example of uh, evolution. The idea is that a single uh, pair of birds flew from South America the, to the islands, and then they uh, diverged gradually into these different species, and that's evolution. Well, uh, uh, this is something, let's suppose first that it's true that it really happened that way. Uh, uh, all it is showing is this uh, you know, variation among, among uh, uh, finches. They're all the same kind of bird. So you aren't seeing the bird change into something different, uh, 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 but uh, just the, these uh, different birds. Uh, moreover, it is now reported that uh, the, 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 some of these birds are coming together. They're flying from island to island and getting together again. And when they do, they mate and have viable offspring. And in that case, they are, by the most commonly used definition of species, in the same species. They, they can have viable offspring. So they're not fundamentally different things in any event. Uh, uh, 
uh, this would be uh, uh, this uh, minor um, uh, 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 variation uh, akin to the peppered moth case. Uh, was there another uh, question? Uh, about Mendel's pea plants. Oh, Mendel's pea plants. Well, this is not showing evolution, uh, um, uh, you know, at all. This is a breeding, you know, of of, uh, uh, of peas to get uh, you know different uh, varieties. It's like a, a, a different color. Sure, you can breed plants. Peas are just one example. Uh, in California, we had a famous breeder, uh, Luther Burbank, who made all these wonderful kinds of flowers that are very amazing uh, things that look quite different. And, and Burbank once wrote, uh, uh, he said, I, I know as a breeder what every breeder knows, which, this, which is that you can get you know, different colors of roses and uh, uh, varieties of uh, plants, but your, 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 uh, your changing only goes so far, and then it stops. You see, what you do, there is a potential for, for variation in the genome of the plant or an animal. The same, this, you get a similar uh, story with dog breeding. So you can get different varieties of dogs. They can all breed together, you know, but, but you, can, you get the different uh, varieties that we all know, cocker spaniels and poodles and so on. Uh, uh, but then the, the amount of variation that is there to be exploited in the dog genome gives out. So you don't change dogs into something basically different. You don't take a, change a dog into a cat. You can get dogs larger and larger until you get to you know, the ultimate, the Great Dane, you know, the largest dog you can get. But you never get a dog as big as an elephant, much less change a dog into an elephant. Because long before that happens, the, the capacity for variation runs out. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, what, what, and, and all of this is, by the way, intelligently guided, anyway, by expert humans. It's not an example of what happens in nature. Thank you. We have a question over here at the microphone. Hi, over here. Uh, I'm just wondering what evidence would support evolution? What evidence? Yeah. Well, the question is, what evidence would support evolution? Well, you see, it all depends what you mean by evolution. Uh, but I, I think it's, I need to, ex mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh. well, um, um, if you mean like a big evolution, you know, from, uh, from insects to human beings, you know, or whatever, now, uh, the, the big creation process, uh, then the evidence, which a Darwinist would say, the evidence which is cited all the time, is uh, similarities. Oh, would, would, would convince me. Yes, well, what I would want to see is a demonstration of the creative process. You see, you would, you would see, uh, uh, instead of a moth population, you know, making these the, the back and forth changes, you would begin to see basic changes in the moth, the beginnings of new kinds of organs, so that you can see that it is on the way to changing into something completely different, and most important, that it is gaining complexity you would begin to see the emergence of new complex organs that did not exist before, like eyes and uh, hearing systems uh, and all, uh, because that's what evolution has to produce. So that's, that's the kind of evidence that would be convincing. It wouldn't be fair to require, you know, that the whole thing be shown, because it would take too long a time, uh, but you would have to see it well on its way uh, in, in order to be confident that the, the process occurred. Yes, that's the kind of evidence that would be needed. Good, good question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can, ge can genetic information evolve? What do mm -hmm. naturalists think, uh, creationists think about this? Mm. Well, um, well, naturalists or you know, evolutionists, Darwinists, have to think that genetic information can evolve and increase. It's not the evolving that's important. It's the increasing. Uh, uh, now, in, in fact, what happens when you leave any uh, kind of information together and subject it to random changes, like mutations, is that the information deteriorates. If, if you, you leave an animal in a radiation chamber and you know, hit it with radiation a lot, it, you, you find a loss of information. It deteriorates and eventually it uh, uh, dies. The same thing will happen with your like, operating system on your computer. Now, if, if you subject it to some electrical interference or whatever that makes random changes, the, the information will change, which means to, that it will 
you'll, you'll get a whole lot less information. Uh, things like random mutations are information destroying changes. Question at the microphone. You mentioned complexity and information. I was wondering if you could more precisely define those two terms and yes. explain why they're important. Yes, I, I will uh, I, I define complexity and information and uh, explain why they are, uh, are uh, uh, important. Uh, uh, uh. Now, information is a very commonly used uh, term. It's the communication of some meaning. Uh, in this case, uh, perhaps the best synonym would be instructions. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that you have in your, the operating system of your computer. You, know, you have a lot of information, and that's what the software engineers have to put together. Uh, a telephone book, or any, any book, but a, a telephone book contains a lot of information. Instructions for how to reach somebody on the uh, a, a telephone. Um, now, um, uh, the information can be either simple or uh, 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 complex. Uh, uh, you see, if, if you just have a simple um, on and off, you know, that, that conveys a, a signal, but it's a simple one, yes, no, yes, no. But in the computer languages, that on and off, on and off, strung together, you know, in various ways can convey a lot of information, only information in the phone book, and it, it, that, that's how the operating system of your computer is is put together, is on those, those simple on and off uh, uh, keys uh, uh, strung together in a long, long string. That's what is complex. Uh, information is complex when it involves a long list of uh, uh, symbols strung together, you say, in an, uh, uh, in an, in an, in an order uh, of, uh, which is uh, 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 not the kind of order that you would get just by, by scrambling things. Okay, the, you know, if, if you have a bunch of Scrabble letters in a, a, a dish and you shake them up, you know, so get them in an order, uh, you won't get uh, uh, either a, a page of Shakespeare or a page of the telephone directory. Uh, uh, because uh, 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 now, now um, you will, however, get some uh, a, a complex order. Uh, and, and this is why, I, you know, your, your question is a good one, and I have to explain that there's, there's an element in addition to complexity. I speak of complex information, but there has to be something in addition to the complexity uh, in order to make uh, my uh, point. Uh, consider if you're dealing out uh, bridge hands. Now, now, any hand that you deal will be complex, it's a complex arrangement of 13 cards, and it will be unusual compared to you know, uh, 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 and yet it happens all the time. But now suppose that you are asked to deal out um, uh, four perfect bridge hands. One all spades, one all diamonds, one all hearts, one all clubs. Now this is a specified complexity. It's not just any complexity, but it is a specified complexity. It's specified it by the need to have the perfection. Uh, I, I, the same would be true of the instructions you know, in the telephone book or in your computer operating system. It's complex and it's also specified. It, just any complex string of symbols won't do. It has to be the specific ones which will do the, the job of running your computer uh, correctly. So that is complex specified information. Uh, the uh, the uh, cell, a biological cell, is a very complicated thing full of a lot of proteins, thousands of them going about and doing different jobs in different parts of the cell. And, and, and there has to be transport systems to take things from one place to another. All of this uh, organized together in a marvelous harmony, a marvelous coordination. And if, if it isn't, your cell doesn't work and you don't have a living organism. Okay. Now that is complex specified information that is needed to run the uh, cell. Right. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, both complex and specified by the need to do the uh, function. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we know that uh, complex specified information is not something that is provided by chance. The mathematical odds against its arising by chance are prohibitive. And it's not provided by law-like order because laws, chemical laws for example, produce something called repetitive order, the same thing over and over again. Uh, and so complex specified information is not uh, 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 produced uh, uh, by either chance or law or a combination. Now, if you want the full uh, explanation of this, you know, our specialist in this matter in the intelligent design movement is Bill Dembski, 
And his, his uh, excellent books on the design inference and intelligent design will explain this with all the math and everything. Enough to give you a headache, it's very satisfying. Uh, <laughs> But if you want a simpler explanation of the uh, whole thing, it's in chapter two of my book, The Wedge of Truth. <laughs> That's at the law professor level. <laughs> Dembski's a mathematician. <laughs> Thank you. Is it true that Watson and Crick admitted that the complexity of the DNA molecule based upon probability required an intelligent designer? Mm -hmm. That is one of the things that did, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, uh, if you, uh, you know, in, in chapter one of my latest book, uh, The Right Questions, I talk about the reaction of a uh, computer scientist uh, who uh, put together the human genome information, you see, that wasn't the biologists who did that. It was done by a computer program. The biologists were involved, but the actual putting together of the sequences to get the genetic program was done by computer scientists. And the one in charge of that for the genetic uh, uh, the, the, the Human Genome Project, I, I said, uh, uh, for the record, he said, there's an enormous amount of intelligence there. He said, some people don't like me to say that, but it's true. It, that, that's what I'm talking about in the complex specified information. And that is what suggests that you have to consider intelligent causes to understand how these living things are being constructed. Uh, chance and Natural law won't do the job. That's, in, you know, of course, in quick summary, the basic argument. We have a question over here at the microphone. Hi. Could you please uh, explain for me the link between uh, your theory that there's a creative force driving the development of life and uh, why I so often hear it used to justify the Bible as somehow mm -hmm. true, oh. or necessarily true, I guess? You're asking me. See, let's see if I get this. I'm asking uh, you. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yes. I'm just asking you, from your experience, you know, your tours, you're talking to people, the link between your theory and how that inherently is used to justify the Bible. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, the, the question is, what is the link between my theory of intelligent design and the use that's made of it by people to justify uh, the Bible or to, to prove the Bible? Yes. Now, um, intelligent design is not aimed at either... Uh, you know, at, at, at explaining or proving or, or, you know, or defending or attacking or anything, the Bible. It's, it's, it's independent of, uh, of, uh, uh, of that. Um, wh whatever you believe about the Bible, you know, one thing or another, you can still understand that there are these logical problems with Darwinism, and so you shouldn't believe it. The ones that I've explained, I won't go over it all again. Uh, but that's independent of any belief you might have on the Bible. And if you conclude that I am right in my arguments, uh, I would not have proved by, by those arguments that the intelligent designer, that the, you know, the intelligent causes necessarily come from the God of the Bible. See, I would not have proved that by that method. Now, I, on the other hand, I believe, as do many other people, that the, the source of the intelligence is God, is the God of the Bible. You see, but, 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 but I, could not, I, I do not prove that to be true by showing that there is a, a, a necessity to consider intelligent causes. You see, it, it's another project, it's another step to demonstrate who that uh, designer is. You, see, you have to go another step. Uh, now, on the other hand, if you believe, if you are inclined to believe that the Bible is true, if you are inclined to believe that the God of the Bible is our creator, then you will find the intelligent design position uh, consistent with that belief. It is, I would say, God-friendly instead of God-hostile. See, Darwinian evolution is God-hostile. Uh, it's aimed at undoing uh, the idea of a creator at all, uh, whereas intelligent design uh, uh, shows uh, that some kind of creator, something capable of designing, must be involved. But it, it takes further inquiry, and, and you know, it, it, it more is involved than the intelligent design argument you know, to come to any conclusions about the Bible. So that's the relationship. Uh, many of us in the intelligent design movement are believers in the Bible, but, but some are not. For example, uh, one of our members who's done some really good work is an agnostic uh, Jew named uh, David Berlinsky. Now, he's written articles on the problems with Darwinism uh, for Commentary magazine. 
which is a you know conservative uh, Jewish publication, and he is able to write for that, where you see some uh, evangelical Christian voice uh, might not be welcome. Uh, so, uh, so our uh, sc scope of membership, you know, participation is wider than that of Bible believers. It's consistent yeah. like with that, but not, 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 not identical. It just seems like you could have, like, for instance, Native American beliefs that would be completely consistent with your theory. Well, that, like, um, it, uh, it could be. Um, uh, that there are a variety of ways in which you might identify the intelligent causes or the designer. I think that is true. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but, um, uh, but I don't want to, you know, to, to give the wrong impression and say that this is, uh, is completely neutral you know, about the Bible either. Because in the present, co in the context, you see, of American culture, there are a lot of Bible believers uh, who uh, uh, are to some extent frustrated by the fact that, you know, that evolution is presented so dogmatically, Darwinian evolution. And when they see that it's all wrong, those Bible believers are much encouraged <laughs> in, in their belief. But they come to their, their biblical faith from something other than just a study of biology. Some, more than that is involved. That's the thing that, you, that has to be understood. Yep. Thank you. Question over here. Yes. Um, how do you explain, or can you even explain, uh, speciation, speciation and adaptation uh, with the con in the context of intelligent design, mm -hmm. or do you attribute that to a genetic drift as well? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, how do I explain speciation and adaptation within the uh, within context of intelligent design? Yes. design? Well, um, let, let me start with adaptation. Uh, 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 it is evident that the, the, uh, uh, the, the designed uh, organisms are, are designed, they have a built-in capacity for variation. See, they have a genetic uh, 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 substance which uh, uh, is, uh, uh, the, the, the is sufficient uh, to, uh, to allow them to vary, and that's one of the things that makes them able to live and reproduce, is that they can vary in response to conditions. And so they do. There is a natural process of adaptation. That 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 that, uh, that designed uh, like, uh, creatures can follow. That's how I explain it. Now, as for speciation, I'm not sure whether there's anything to explain. See, domestic animal breeders um, are not able to produce new uh, species. There are some doubtful cases that are debated, uh, but as a rule, at least, uh, 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 you you don't produce spe speciation uh, even by uh, designed. Uh, uh, yeah, human uh, 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 breeding. That uh, evolution in the wild produces a speciation is is very uh, 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 you know doubtful. Um, but even if it does, even if there you know again I you know there there may be d debatable cases, and I don't want to uh, you know, try to deal with uh, all of them. Let us suppose that, for example, that 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 we could find uh, that uh, uh, in, in in some case. Uh, uh, oh, fruit flies are often used in breeding experiments. This is artificial selection, but it's an illustration. They're often used in these experiments. Uh, 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 you, you, you might be able to, in fact, I, you know, uh, th these are the doubtful cases I have in mind in particular. You can find a, a fruit fly that is so different that it cannot breed successfully with some other fruit flies, or the other fruit flies. Right? It's still a fruit fly, but it, it can no longer breed with the main uh, species, and maybe you could produce another one which it could breed with. Then you would have a new species. If you do, now species is a term which unfortunately has no fixed definition, <laughs> but the most common definition is an isolated breeding group. Okay? So then if, if that were to happen, then the Darwinists would say, wow, you know, we've produced a new species, now we've pr proved everything. But they haven't. They, of course they haven't. The important thing is not whether you can produce a, a, you know, a, a fruit fly uh, who that can only breed in May, and that therefore can't breed with fruit flies that can only breed in August. Right? Even though technically you could describe those as different species, what you want to produce is a fruit fly that becomes something other than a fruit fly. I mean, I mean eventually you've got to take a bacterium and, and over sufficient time uh, turn it into a human being. <laughs> so, so speciation is important to Darwinists. Uh, but it, uh, 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 because they've sort of set it as a kind of a bar that they have to meet, 
uh, but but it, it, it's it's only one tiny step towards the the thing that's really got to be proved. And, and even then, wh whether it's ever demonstrated or not is doubtful. Thank you. You got a question over here on the left. I'm a little out of my element, being an engineer by trade, but. Um, Talk about there not being any evidence of an increase of information in uh, in the DNA or in a species. Is there an evidence that over long periods of time there's been actually a decrease of information? Because I seem to remember having read some articles that indicate there have been. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, uh, 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 yes. Uh, uh, this this is uh, uh, the case. I'll, um, uh, although um, I, I too am reluctant to go very deeply into the most technical you know issues. Although I can. You know, recommend the literature, which uh, covers it uh, uh, better. But the, the the fact is that mutations are known to generally result in a decrease in information. Now, consider, for example, the mutation that makes a mosquito resistant to DDT. This has been studied by a, 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 an Israeli scientist named uh, Lee Spetner. In the book, uh, Not By Chance, is very interesting. And he, he, his uh, study indicate, and th this is, is, I think, uh, very uh, uh, reasonable, that, um, that, that that mosquito isn't gaining genetic information. It's losing something. It's losing the capacity uh, to metabolize a certain kind of chemical. Okay? It's losing in the in information. And uh, this is not a, an advantage under normal circumstances. It's only an advantage when it's in an atmosphere that's filled with this poison. See, so it looks like an advantage temporarily, but then when you take away the DNA, they, I, I, I take away the insecticide, you take away the DDT, then what happens to the mosquito population is that it goes back to normal. See, because the, 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 the previous condition where the population was not particularly resistant to DDT is in fact the more fit situation under ordinary circumstances. So the, even, even with, when you have an an example of an advantageous mutation, it may involve a loss of DDT, of, 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 of genetic information, a loss of genetic information. Thank you. Um, I have a written question here. If Adam and Eve were the first two humans on Earth, how is it that we have so many different races? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they all be just the same as Adam and mm -hmm. Eve? Uh, well, um, you know, the, sort of the Adam and Eve question is uh, not one, which obviously is part of the intelligent design uh, case. However, what I, I can answer the question is that the idea that the human species started out with a single breeding pair you know, is, is, is not peculiar uh, to the biblical account. The evolutionists believe that too. As I, that, that they think as first a human a pair evolved from apes, but, but there's still one, one breeding pair that, that uh, starts it uh, off. Uh, again, it's the same question as to how do you fit adaptation into the design uh, paradigm. It's simply that when the, the, the creatures appear, designed as they are, they appear with the genetic capacity to vary, and then that is brought out you know, over the years in the environmental circumstances. A question over here. Um, I've been reading some information lately about anthropology. And there's evidence that in the past few centuries, human skeletons have changed, like we've gotten taller, our eyes have gotten bigger, and our jaws have gotten smaller. Would that support a mutation in evolution? Mm -hmm. uh, you are asking uh, uh, about evidence that in, in over what period of time? Uh, like the past five centuries. The past five centuries that human, uh, human jaws have gotten smaller? I believe she said skulls, jaws, eyes. And skulls are larger. Uh -huh. Well, I, you know, I, see, I don't know whether that is the case <laughs> or not. Uh, 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 if it is, uh, you know, there is a variation like that. Uh, 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 you know, that 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 is not uh, what I would call evolution in in the in the important sense, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the word. Uh, uh, remember, evolution is supposed to be the story of life from the first replicating molecule that can reproduce uh, you know, all the way up to human beings and all these uh, basic changes. So some kind of alteration in the size of jaws uh, of human beings would be an interesting thing to know about if it's true. Uh, I don't know whether it is, but uh, 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 it, it, would be, it, would, it would not be the kind of thing we are talking about, uh, capable of bringing new uh, uh, sorts of 
things that didn't exist before into existence or, or increasing complexity. I have a question over here. Uh, yes, I was wondering, you hold Darwinism to a very high uh, empirical standard. Do you hold your own theory to the mm -hmm. same standard? Mm -hmm. And uh, sure. how would you empirically test such a uh, yes. theory? Yes, a good question. How would I empirically test uh, you know, intelligent design? Um, and uh, the, I, I can make a very uh, a direct answer to that. Uh, the, the, uh, pro remember, the proposition of the intelligent design movement is that in, intelligence is necessary you know, to do bi biological creation or basic uh, change. Uh, 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 the test of this is Darwinism. Right? If Darwinism is true, then the, the, the intelligent design theory is false. Right? Because the basic claim of Darwinian evolution is that you don't need intelligence. Uh, random variation and natural selection can do the whole job. So if you could demonstrate the, the power of that Darwinian creation mechanism, then that would falsify intelligent design. See, there, there, there are really two answers to the same question. You know, do you need intelligence or do you not need intelligence? The test of one is pretty much the uh, uh, test uh, uh, of another. Y you might show unintelligent processes producing new biological organs, or wh whatever, or even writing, um, you know, pages in a book. And that would be a falsification of the intelligent design proposition. Okay, also, uh, let me think about this. I, no, I'll come back in a second. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for the, uh, the question. That's a challenging one, and it's good. I have a question over here. Oh. Hi. Um, you were talking about the peppered moths earlier in mm -hmm. your lecture. I was wondering where, where do they rest, if not on tree trunks? I, I didn't hear the end of that. Uh, he was wondering where they do rest, where the peppered moths do rest, if not oh. on tree trunks. Uh, uh, yes, the... the, um, uh, the, the uh, Governing explanation all uh, is that they're up in the branches of the tree, not on the trunks. See where they're, where they're out of sight. There is, uh, I, I believe, some degree of mystery about it, but the the important thing is that they're not observed resting on the tree trunks in the natural condition. I have a question over here. Yeah, you commented uh, earlier about. Um, transitional fossils in the fossil record. Um, I w was interested in how you would explain a transitional fossil such as Archaeopteryx, mm -hmm. which is a transition between reptiles and birds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. the, the question is about uh, uh, the uh, Ar Archaeopteryx. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, technically, um, there is some uh, a question about whether, whether it is that. It's a uh, it, it, it is uh, often classified as simply a bird with certain reptilian characteristics, but that it is a, a, a bird. I don't want to rest on that kind of an argument, however, which I think is really quibbling with the main point. Um, and the, um, the point is uh, this. If the um, Darwinian theory is true, the fossil record should be replete with transitional forms. Uh, uh, they, sh they should be all over the place because, you see, that should be a constant process of uh, gradual uh, change. And the, uh, the fossil record uh, 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 doesn't show that. To transitional forms, uh, even ones which are alleged and, uh, by, the, by the evolutionary scientists who are so eager to prove their theory, are extremely rare. That was Stephen Gould's uh, statement that the extreme rarity of transitional uh, 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 forms in the fossil record is the trade secret of uh, paleontology. Now, uh, the reason why Gould and Eldridge had to propose their theory of evolution by punctuated equilibria is that extreme rarity. They both thought that Archaeopteryx was an exceptional case the, of, a of a transitional. Now, uh, if, uh, uh, now, if the explanation for the absence of transitional forms is the incompleteness of the fossil record, then uh, you would expect to find the transitionals where the fossil record is the most complete. Now, um, in animals, you see uh, birds and reptiles, land animals, land vertebrates, and especially birds, are hardly ever fossilized. The reason is just common sense. They, uh, but when they die, they're out in the open and exposed to the elements, and they get eaten by scavengers. So, so they don't become fossilized. If your ambition in life is to become a fossil, what you should do you see, is to live in the shallow seas like marine invertebrates do. 
uh, like tri the, the, the trilobites, uh, 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 the clams, the mollusks, uh, that, that, that's the crabs. Uh, when they die, they're covered up by sediment and, and uh, 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 protected from uh, the elements and the air uh, and, of course, from scavengers. So they become fossilized in very large numbers. And why, that's why, why most of the animal uh, fossils in the record are marine invertebrates. Uh, and Niles Eldridge, who was Gould's uh, uh, partner in the punctuated equilibria papers, is a student of trilobites. Say, and, and so uh, it is, it is uh, interesting that it was the study of marine invertebrates see, that led to this realization that transitionals are absent. And so we have to invent this new uh, uh, theory of evolution by punctuated equilibria to account for the absence. All of the claimed transitional fossils that you hear about are, are like Opteryx or like the so-called, you know, the ape men, the so-called hominids from the land vertebrates, which are hardly ever uh, fossilized. So the, the transitionals are found just where the fossil record is most incomplete rather than where it is complete, which is a, a very powerful discrediting of the uh, uh, whole uh, 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 approach. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, now, uh, one, you know, it's very difficult to prove a negative, and I certainly cannot prove that none of the claimed examples really is a transitional. I say that's, that would be a very difficult uh, thing to carry. But one must remember that this burden of, that this absence of proof, this absence of finding them, especially in the marine invertebrates, um, uh, is the result of uh, uh, many decades of effort by people who were all uh, uh, enormously determined to prove the Darwinian theory, to find the transitionals. Their careers depended on it, and yet they couldn't find them. Eldridge explains this very uh, candidly in his papers, you know, what the incentive was uh, and how they, they had to invent the punctuated equilibrium to save their careers. Uh, 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 they weren't really uh, failing. This is all explained in chapter four of uh, Darwin on Trial. <laughs> yes, I have a chapter on everything uh, by now. A few more questions? Ex excuse me if this is out of the scope you wish to discuss tonight, but what ethical imp implication implications does intelligent design have, and would you use it as an explanation for this cross-cultural find of the golden rule? Uh oh. Well, uh, uh, the question is about the ethical implications of intelligent design. I, I should probably first start out with the ethical implications of Darwinism. The, the, the ethical implication of Darwinism is that the creator is imaginary. We're all the result of purposeless natural processes that don't care anything about what we do. And so, you know, with, with God uh, vanishes as no longer needed, God's morality goes with him. And uh, that is a very significant moral change. It's one of the reasons why this subject is much too important to leave to the professional biologists. It has cultural uh, uh, consequences. But I will answer your question more directly than that also. Um, uh, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Jay Budziszewski, it's a name you, you may have run across. It's a Polish name. It's, it's, it's spelled Bud Zizewski, pronounced Budziszewski. Uh, uh, he is a, 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 a prominent writer, uh, uh, in, you know, particularly in Christian circles, on natural law, which is, you know, to say the the kind of of uh, uh, law which is not you know passed by a legislature, but which is common to people from different cultures. That's part of our nature, and he bases his uh, understanding of natural law on the theory that we are designed. You see, we are designed in our environment. Our world is designed as well, so that some things are good for us in the behavioral, moral level, and other things are not. And this can be perceived by people from a variety of cultures. So uh, that is a brief statement of the implications for uh, ethics of uh, the design approach. It's a necessary component of the belief in a m moral law which is perceived by people from different cultures. It's not just human created. Thank you. Mm -hmm. a question over here. Um, even with research tax dollars, scientists don't make very much money, certainly not as much as, as lawyers, for example. So I'm just curious what the, uh, motivates this Darwinian agenda? What do you see as motivating it that an entire discipline would really embrace it? The motivation for, you, I'm asked about the motivation. Of, of all of these scientists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
Well, there is no doubt that uh, um, uh, you know, biologists uh, ex accepted the Darwinian claims uh, very eagerly. And they accepted them long before the peppered moth evidence was in, you know, for whatever, uh, uh, because the, the theory had great appeal to them. See, it seemed to provide a scientific explanation. And following Darwin himself, they thought that a scientific explanation was an explanation that uh, excluded God from any role in the creating process. So there was this eagerness to accept. Now, after the acceptance had, been, had occurred, uh, a tremendous number of vested interests developed around the theory. You see, now, um, uh, if... A, the theory were to come under a serious question and perhaps fall from uh, a, a public acceptance, uh, a lot of people would find their careers damaged. Uh, and other people would find that they were faced with the possible reality of something, the creator who cares about what they do that they don't want to face. Uh, so there are, there are tremendous vested interests uh, behind the theory of people who desperately want it to be true uh, and who fight very hard to protect it from criticism. Now, having said that, I, I want to add that, that the fact that they have a motive to argue their case uh, it doesn't prove that the theory is wrong. I rely on the evidence and the logic that I've already given you to show that the theory is wrong. All of the Motivation and the vested interests explain is why uh, people are so eager to defend the theory and don't really want to look at the disconfirming evidence. They don't want to see it and they don't want to know about it. And that's why you will, you will find out that, for, for example, that uh, biologists are not eager to hear in their classes from skeptical voices. Try it and you'll find out. Maybe the hard way. Thank you. Another question over here? Good evening, sir. How would you reconcile the intelligent design movement uh, with some of the phenomena in particle physics, uh, particularly the chaos theory, oh. where you have electrons who are not, which are not only eccentric, but which operate apparently fully on random? How could you reconcile mm. that with intelligent design, sir? Mm. Uh, I, I don't have to uh, reconcile the, the intelligent design theory about life with the behavior of electrons, which are non-living. If you were to show me electrons becoming living organisms, that would create a problem. There's uh, a possibility of that occurring in an experiment at Stanford where they first synthesized a protein molecule. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if, if a protein molecule was synthesized, this was done with a massive input from human intelligence and technology, not by leaving amino acids around in an addition, you know, waiting for it to self-assemble. Thank you. Have another question over here? I love these uh, questions and <laughs> the, the challenging ones, supportive ones, whatever. I had heard, I had heard uh, and read uh, a couple of years ago that Darwin, uh, toward the latter years of his life, uh, recant he didn't necessarily recant his theory, but he did say that if you could not find the missing link, as it were, that his theory was not true. Is that, is that mm. correct? Mm. Um, well, uh, uh, many biographies have been written of, uh, of Darwin, and there are a lot of uh, uh, things to explain. There is a persistent l legend in Christian circles that Darwin recanted and became a Christian on his deathbed and uh, abandoned the theory. This is probably not true. It's uh, 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 the, the family all denied it, and uh, the, the, it's not well supported uh, historically. Uh, Darwin moved from farther away from Christian belief throughout his life. Um, uh, what he, I don't know of anything about him saying if you can't find the missing link. That sounds to me, in fact, like modern talk. I don't think he, Darwin said any, that, that in those words. What I know that he did say, what he did write, is that if you can find an organ which could not possibly have been built up by slow, gradual steps through natural selection, then my theory would absolutely collapse. Now, um, this is a trick. I say it's, 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 uh, uh, it's to saying that uh, you have to prove the negative. You have to prove that there's something that is absolutely impossible for, you know, uh, 
the mechanism of my theory to produce. Uh, you have to, and, and uh, everyone that studied these matters knows that it is, in principle, uh, uh, almost impossible to prove a negative. Okay. So he said, I don't have to produce positive evidence. You have to prove the impossibility of it. So uh, uh, Darwin often sounded like he was much more open-minded and open to refutation than he really than he really was. Looks like we have two more questions here. Start over here with you, sir. Okay. Um, First of all, I'd like to ask uh, why the strong, why the strong separation between Darwinist and uh, Darwinist and creationist? Because it seems to me that you could be both, or you, there could be a gray area involved. Is that the question? Yes, that's the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, there isn't a great overlap, uh, even though you may uh, think so. And I, I think to understand that, what you have to realize is that it is not so much the conclusions that Darwin's come to that creates the, the great gulf between them and theists, you know, who think that God did the creating. It's not so much the conclusions they come to as it is the way they reason to those conclusions. Right? It's the reasoning process that really creates the uh, gulf. Uh, uh, to a Darwinist, it is evident as a matter of logic, before you look at the evidence, that there must be a naturalistic creation process. Why? Because God is ruled out of consideration in science. Well, um, how can you make that assumption if you really believe God is there and willing to create? Okay, so the, the, the whole thing starts out with the rejection of God as having anything to do with our creation. It's not the evidence that makes them come to that conclusion. It's their first premise. So uh, when people say evolution is God's way of creating, then, um, see, in uh, the first place, they're saying that godless, purposeless evolution is God's way of creating, because that's what Darwinism is. See, and and, and they're there's, they're, they're, they're putting in at the end of the process what they removed at the beginning. You remove God at the beginning. You say, we know that uh, uh, a purposeless material process of evolution did the creating because God is out of the picture. And now having come to that conclusion, isn't it nice that God chose to create that way? <laughs> See, that is not coherent thinking. Uh, secondly, just one other point. You said it's impossible to prove a negative uh, but earlier you said that... Uh, ordinarily, I... Ordinarily. There may be but, special <laughs> cases where you can. But earlier you said that uh, the only way to prove your theory was to prove that Darwinism was not true. Mm, hey, um, well, I, 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 I don't say you prove that it is not true. What you prove... Now, this is the appropriate question. You prove that it is not supported by the scientific evidence, but merely by philosophical dogma, i say. See, so that is what, what we show. The Darwinism would falsify uh, 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 intelligent design if it were what I may have said true, but the important sense in which I meant that is supported by the scientific evidence. Uh, and uh, 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 if it's not supported by the scientific evidence, uh, 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 then it, it, it doesn't do the job of falsifying under scientific standards. Now. So we'll get to our last question here. Hello. I was watching the Discovery Channel the other day, and they had this program on about evolution, and it had on all, all these pedestals, all these different... They have a lot of programs on television about I, evolution, I don't they? Yeah, Trying to get yeah, you to believe it. Yeah, I know. But um, they had all these skulls on pedestals, and there was one of Lucy, and then there was one from before that and one after that, and there was like a whole long line of 15 of them. And they started out looking like monkeys, and then the last one looked more like human beings. So how do you explain that? If mm -hmm. it looks kind of yes. like evolution, but... Then what oh, is I'm, thank you for asking this uh, question. This is a good way to conclude the evening. Uh, uh, I, you know, how do I explain what you might call the hominid series? Right. Which is, if you'll go to a, a natural history museum or something, then you might see skulls lined up, or you might even see whole um, bodies lined up. And saying, you'll see this one that's hunched over and looks about ape-like, and then another one that looks a little more man-like, and then you finally get up and you get to the very, very manlike one, and this is showing the whole sequence. So, right. you know, and, 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 uh, now, uh, 
you, I, I think you, you need to understand a, 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 you know, a few things I'll, I'll cover uh, in my answer, and then for all the rest, you knew it, didn't you? I wrote a chapter on that. It's chapter six of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, Darwin on trial, you know, about the hominid evidence. Now, um, all of the people who go out and collect the bones that form these uh, impressions or the skulls are, 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 are people who really believe without uh, uh, any reservation whatsoever. You know, in the theory, they're going and looking for evidence to uh, support it. Right. Um, and this is likewise true of the people who do the arranging in the museums and the reconstructions. Now, I, I don't know what skulls you've seen, but, but most of what you'll see in, a, in an exhibit or in a television show involves things which have been heavily reconstructed by artists who are also m meaning to illustrate the, the uh, theory. Uh, 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 it is unclear whether uh, there is um, any real independent basis uh, you know, for, for, for aligning the skulls or the bodies in that way. Uh, one episode that uh, it much attracted my attention is it's true that in uh, uh, a, a, a number of years ago, I think probably back in the uh, 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 1960s, uh, a, uh, the, the leading uh, uh, primate, that is ape expert of Great Britain, a well-known scientist named Sally Zuckerman, examined all of the existing uh, 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 hominid, you know, ape-man fossils, and he said, um, uh, these could all just be variant forms of apes. Right? Uh, there is no reason to conclude that they're anything but apes. Right? Now, uh, 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 of course, the you know, anthropologists who you know, collect these things dispute that very vigorously. Uh, uh, but um, it's hard for an outsider to understand what to make of any of this because uh, they have such a strong motive to prove the theory. They're not testing the theory. They're out looking for evidence to put on a television show to convince you that it's true. And so there is this enormous selection bias in the whole process. That's not really a science. Uh, and, and so I would say that all of those skulls and all of the hominid evidence is very powerful evidence of the faith of the physical anthropologists, of the strong belief they have in the theory. The belief precedes the evidence. But now, I, I want again to, 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 not to rest on that, but to make the most powerful point at the, uh, you know, to, to conclude it, which is that uh, uh, the real test is, do we know a mechanism that could possibly take an ape and change it into a human being with all of the human mental uh, abilities and all that are so different from you know, anything that apes uh, present. And of course, no, we don't. I've, I've already made the point that there's no evidence that na natural selection has a creative power uh, uh, at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, the human intelligence is uh, often uh, attributed to a larger brain. That itself is a very questionable assumption, but you know, the, 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 the physical anthropologists speak about the brains getting larger, the skull getting larger. That's part of what you saw, probably, is larger brain case, larger uh, skull. Well, they also you have know, weird and so they're evolving. But you know what would happen? What, what happens when the head gets bigger? You know, that is what makes for enormous uh, pain, danger, and death in childbirth for the females. I just, you know, that says human females suffer. If there is anything that natural selection could be expected to weed out, it would be something that causes death in childbirth and hence, you know, uh, prevents uh, uh, effective reproduction. Uh, so, so that's my uh, view, but uh, I have explained my view at much greater length in chapter six of Darwin on Trial. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson, for getting, coming tonight. All right. Appreciate well, thank you all. It's fun to. Fun to uh, have the interchange. Thanks, all of you, for asking the questions that did.